What's up with you? Great things, great things. So um, we are talking about Fannie Lou Hamer and um, we did a short film about her and a lot of that uh, was predicated on your desire to tell this woman's story. And mm -hmm. I want you to talk about why you think it's important to tell this story now. Well, um, I love the introduction, um, the and this idea of reclamation, and um, and this idea that um, um, of telling story as a way, in my mind, to to um, um, you know, I, I think I just have to say this, you know. It, the the great migration, you know, our families had to do what they had to do in order to um, survive. So they had to leave Mississippi, and in in the case of my family, they went to um, Chicago, they went to Milwaukee, some of them went to Detroit, like your family, um, some of them went to Los Angeles, um, like my family, and they went to San Francisco. Um, but the what happened as a result of that is it left it left a vacancy and um and so what is left behind has sort of been colonized um by uh confederates by white supremacists and so we have a lot of work to do um in order to do that reclamation to take that to take that space back, to take that cultural space back, to take that political space back, um, and the physical to take the land back. And I'm encouraging anybody who's under the sound of my voice, as we say in church, um, to come back home, to buy property, so you can be, so you can vote. Mm -hmm. And um, I, I have to be real, you know, real specific and 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 raw about that. And a part of that is, yes, we tell the story, but what's also in incredibly important is that it's not enough that the story be told, what also matters is who's doing the storytelling. And why is that? Because we have been, our stories have been told to us through the prism of white supremacy, through the prism, the voice, of white supremacy through the prism, the voice of racism. Um, and as a result of that, what happens is, is we have white filmmakers, we'll, we'll just talk about, I mean, there's the educational part of that because that's a whole thing. Um, and But for me, in my mind, the cinema, television, are ha have to be the places where we do the storytelling because they refuse, as we see, as we witness with the whole critical race theory thing, they mm. refuse to let it happen in traditional classrooms. So for me, the cinema has to be the classroom. The television ha has to be the classroom. Um, and what I know, what I have learned in, you know, I've been educated a long, long time. I went all kind, got all kinds of degree. Well, not I got one degree, but I went to undergrad and I actually majored in African American studies. And not, I did not learn about Mrs. Hamer, not one day, not one moment of my education was spent. Not one moment was spent on Mrs. Hamer. And this is intentional. There's a, there's a reason why we don't know the impact of Mrs. Hamer on electoral politics in 2022. There is a reason. And so what you have done, Christine, and my, my partnering with you is, is what we have to do is, first of all, insist that we do the telling, but also what we have to do is acknowledge in that, you know, we have been miseducated. We have been undereducated. And so... It, 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 so yes, it's a, it's, it's one thing to say, okay, now we need to know about Mrs. Hamer, but when that, when the voice comes through, when the filter of that is a black woman, there is honesty there. There's honesty. There's a truth there that he up to up until this point has not existed before, at least in my personal experience. And I know I'm not alone. And in many ways, in filtering stories through the prism of the Black female lens, um, you feel that it hits people differently. Um, 
from your experience of having done multiple stories um, as, as an actress, as a, as a writer too, like how, why is it important also that, that, that we do it um, unassisted by a white lens? Well, this, the storytelling is, is, is pivotal. The, the writing of it, who's behind the camera, um, th those things are those things are pivotal. Now let's let's we let's be very very real. The reality of filmmaking in America um, is the reality is is that you know that's that the the politics not the politics the economics of that is still very much white. It's just the reality. So, um, but the places that we have to insist on uh, insist on are you know. Um, it, the writing of it, the, the directing of it, and everywhere, everywhere else, everywhere else that we can. What I know is that from my own experience as an actor, and you can speak to this as a director, but from my own experience as an actor, what I know is that when I'm in situations where, you know, I've been on both sides of it, where I have a writer who is absolutely brilliant, they are not Black. And they're absolutely brilliant, but even and 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 also very generous and open to open to the idea of my existence as a black woman, right? And open to what you know my my perspective. Um, but even even in the even in the face of that, there are some things that they just don't know. They just don't know it because they've never lived it, and you know you can imagine it. There's the perspective of someone who's who is who is imagining something, but there's the perspective of someone who has lived it, and they're very very different. And then I've been on the other side of it, where I have where a a uh, someone who is who is white, um, is trying to tell the story of, of that centers a black woman, and they have been utter, have been honestly I, there's no other way to say this, but. The, the 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 there's an arrogance that 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 is disinterested in who I am and my my perspective about that my position is how can you tell a story about me when you don't care about me so that's what in my mind makes a difference when you have when you have uh, black woman storytellers amen um, I think it's particularly important right now that um, there's this renewed sense of interest in Fannie Lou Hamer, just kind of floating in the atmosphere. Maybe not enough yet, but um, one of one of the goals being um, that uh, we bring a spotlight to to this woman and what she has contributed to the the fabric of of America. That that is important and pivotal, pivotal, and not as well known. So to to that end, uh, you wrote this extraordinary screenplay called Sunflower, the Fannie Lou Hamer story, and I just I just want you to talk a little bit about uh, the genesis of that, and um, what inspired you from a personal personal perspective as a Mississippi native. Well, I want us to be clear about this: that the sh the short film is 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 separate. Mm -hmm. um, the short film was directed by Christine, and God bless her. God bless her, Christine. You know, this came out of conversations that we've been having for a long time, and um, you know, I'll talk about it, but Christine will be about it. And so she submitted this, um, and I was like, "Go ahead, girl." You know, and with no help from me, because I was just too much in my head about it. And um, you know, well, let's, let's, let's pause and mention uh, we submitted it to a competition by Chromatic yes. Black. By Chromatic Black. Ida B. Thank well, you so much, Chromatic Black. Uh, yes, and they yes. they solicited filmmakers to submit ideas um, that that spoke to disruptive filmmaking. Yes. And, and I thought, like, who's most disruptive than, than Fannie Lou Hamer and Anjanou Ellis? And like, what can we do to put them together in a way that um, that one, we can maybe win this this little money that they gave us. And without which I'm sure. not sure that we would have made this short film. Yeah. So a huge shout out 
to chromatic black that's really doing the Thank work you. to allow us exactly. to do the creative work. Exactly. So, okay, so talk, talk about that. So we just thought, yeah. what if we did a proof of concept? You said that to me. You said, could we create a proof of concept about Fannie Lou Hamer feature film or something like that? And it was just embedded in my head, right? And then I saw this competition and I thought, I wonder if we can win this and maybe use the money and do a short film about Fannie Lou Hamer, and which we did. We called it Fanny. Uh, I think it's out there in, in the uh, universe now, and I want everybody to see it to get a glimpse of, of what women represented. But the flip side of it is to get a glimpse of what this woman, Anjanu Ellis, can do with this role. So to that end, okay, answer the rest of the question about the genesis of the, of the the, the narrative feature screenplay that to me is, is a bigger picture of this important story that needs to be told. Well, a few years ago, well, let me backtrack for a second and say again, thank you, Chromatic Black. Thank you so much because we really we 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 thought, okay, we might say, we might have something here. You know, it just it just you know, leapt out of our, you know, midnight conversations into Christine flying to Chicago, hiring a crew and filming something on a, on a rainy day in, in, in Chicago. So tears in my eyes when I say thank you so much for believing, for believing in us, Chromatic Black, thank you. Um, that should have been the first thing I said, charge it to my head and not my heart. Um, but a few years ago, I, I, you know, Mrs. Hamer was on my brain because uh, I was, you know, I, along with a whole bunch of other people, were still battling this Confederate flag issue in Mississippi and, you know, suffering, personal suffering, because I did not know enough about myself as a citizen of Mississippi, like having an understanding of every day the everyday pain that comes from living in a in a cloistered racist society that it is can be suffocating to pass by that flag on my way to the gym on my way to the bank it is an everyday reminder of the confederacy it is it is a it is a lived experience and what i know is there is that mississippi but there's also the mississippi that was incredibly revolutionary and incredibly radical and it changed the course of politics in this country as we know it and so few people know that so few people know what mrs hamer did in 1964 at the democratic national convention that she changed the course of politics in this country as we know it i'm not overselling this you look it up it's what happened. So I said, you know, if if ain't nobody else gonna do it, you got it. You know, I I would. So what I tried to do, what I tried to do was try to find some filmmakers. I wanted them all to be from Mississippi, and you know that didn't work out. So I said, you know what, girl, just try to do it yourself. So I started writing, and I kept writing, and I kept writing, and then you know it, it got to a point where I started to share it gingerly. <laughs> with um with other people and Christine was one of those one of those people and has been a cheerleader for it and a you know one wonderful collaborator since then. So yes, that's that's it. And give a little uh, snippet about how Fannie Lou Hamer changed the face of the Democratic Party. Um well really um very short story. I'll make it as short as possible because I want folks to actually look this up themselves. Um, Mrs. Hamer, along with the Mississippi Freedom De Democratic Party, um, along with uh, the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, they went to the Democratic National Convention in 1964. And what they decided was they would be the answer to the all white, all male white delegation that um, would would um, uh, that were that was going to the convention in 1964. It was all white, all white men, all all white men, and they said, you know, the, these folks from Mississippi, that it, the Mississippi Freedom Democratic Party, which was comprised of sharecroppers and farmers and beauticians and domestic, you know, maids and hairdressers, you know. 
and you know people led by people like Ella Baker and Bob Moses they 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 said to these folks you are enough you can be your own leaders and so buoyed by that they formed the Mississippi Freedom Democratic Party and they said no we are the true representatives of the state of Mississippi so they got on a bus and they went to New Jersey and um and insisted to the credentials committee the credential the credentials committee is the committee who decides who takes the seats at at the convention and because of their presence the the all white all male delegation was not allowed to be seated um and i'm gonna I'm, that's all i'm gonna say and I think because I, I want people to um, I want people to do the research. And also when people see the film, this is what Mrs. Hamer, this was her testimony. This was her testimony to the Democratic National Convention, to the to the Credentials Committee, stating her case as to why she knew that she was who should be seated and who should be representing the folks from the state of Mississippi. Very, very powerful. So let, let me read this quote and then I want you to comment on this. So following reconstruction, a white backlash stole voting rights from African-Americans, instituted Jim Crow laws and spawned the Ku Klux Klan. During and after the civil rights movement, white backlash led to efforts to intimidate us from exercising our votes and suppress turnout among black, brown and indigenous voters. Um, almost 400 bills aimed at limiting our freedom to vote have been introduced. In Georgia, the legislator, legislature created additional pathways to interfere, even giving itself the power to take over local elections, including the ability to overturn results that they dislike. Mm -hmm. That's the past meeting the present. Exactly. How does how does Fannie Lou Hamer's legacy uh, tie in to these voter suppression issues that still, um, you know, taint America today? Mrs. Hamer, Mrs. Hamer had was didn't just battle white folks. Ms. Ha Mrs. Hamer, Mrs. Hamer had to battle people who looked like her. And one of the reasons that she had to battle is because she was insisting that it is not enough for us to, it, it, it is not enough for us to get this civil rights leg legislation that Lyndon Johnson was going to sign. Um, she said, this is not enough. This is not enough. Uh, she had the foresight to see that in 2022, we would still be dealing with these issues. Mm -hmm. And at the time there were people who were ready to settle for the crumbs, as she called them, crumbs that this country was offering. And she was not, she was not, she was not. And so um, this is one of the reasons why she was, she was, she was, she made it, she, she made it very uncomfortable for a lot of people who just really wanted to want it, who wanted to make decisions for the moment. And that's not what she wanted. She wanted something that would be lasting. She wanted something that Christine and Anjanu would enjoy. And um, and she knew that settling for what was being offered, what was being offered at the time would mean that we would still be battling what we're battling right now. And I want you, I'm gonna turn it over to you, Christine. And and I want to hear your hear your thoughts on that. Well, um, uh, you know my ongoing rant about um, truly the way to 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 be powerful in in America, and I think in the world is 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 to be meek. And what what's so inspiring about Family Hamer is is there's a level of meekness and power, you know. And I'm just a firm believer, um, and I want to be in, in the idea that the meek shall inherit the earth. But what I love is that her story wasn't done, you know, um, even way after she passed. Right. And and the and, and she really just planted a seed. Mm -hmm. And and I feel like we are we're we are the generation 
that now are, we're enjoying the fruits of her labor. Mm -hmm. And it's ironic that her story has been relegated to the back seats of the civil rights movement stories. And it's, it's not surprising because um, like we said at the top, our stories are, are told through the lens of power and politics. So who, he who holds the power, politics and runs the economics um, decide uh, what lens through which we see our our own stories, our own stories, right? So I feel like um, given time and given understanding and education that we've had to learn on our own, somehow it's all coming together in a way that we have the skill set, we have the the the, the um, individual power to know what what story needs to be told and through what lens and 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 how we're going to be able to do it so and, and that's really what chromatic black is about and the fact that we've gotten this far is is just one step in in truly um empowering us as black people and owning our stories in a way that we can share with the world and the culture that's impactful so anybody could tell these stories I always say, like, how impactful are, are they in a, in a meaningful way? And who's telling them will oftentimes um, tell you how and why it's working or not. So I think this is this is a step in the right direction. And we're obviously not going to stop until we get this done. And um, we do things with, with excellence and, and um, great uh, intention. And, and great power. So that's that's how I'm feeling about where we're going. And that's my two cents. Yeah, you know, the thing about the thing about this is that Mrs. Hamer did not, Mrs. Hamer was not an advocate for, for civil rights. Mrs. Hamer was an advocate for freedom rights. For the right to be a for the right to be a human being, and 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 not be viewed as an animal. And mm -hmm. this is how this country was and and still does as they kill us in the streets. Mm -hmm. This is how we are. This is how we are treated. So mm -hmm. when when Mrs. Hammer wanted Mrs. Hammer want, had a, a holistic approach to. The, the black experience in America um, and that she wanted the, the wholeness of, of, of being black and being woman to be respected, to be honored. Mm -hmm. um, and, and, and that battle is not simply fought in, in a legislature. That's it's right. not fought in a courthouse. Mm -hmm. um, it's not fought in the United Nations. It's not fought in the White House. It is, it, it, is, it is represented in those places, but it is not won in any of those places as we now see. Wow. Doesn't, whether it's whoever's in the White House. That's right. It does not matter. And, 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 and her, vision, her vision then spoke to the, our reality now that we have to have, and, and she had this great partner in Ella Baker, Mm -hmm. who were constantly talking about capitalism and imperialism. I mean, these women were so brilliant, you mm -hmm. know, and that foresight that they had um, was separated them from, separated them from their peers. Mm -hmm. So what it says to me is that we got work to do that. She, as you said, she planted the seed and now we gotta, we gotta do the harvesting. Amen. Amen. And to that end, we are going to exit now and um, show and premiere uh, Fanny, the short film about Fanny Lou Hamer, starring Anjanu Ellis, directed by yours truly. Thank you so much. Thank you, Anjanu and uh, Chromatic Black. Thank you, Chromatic Black. Yes. Thank you so much. Bye-bye, everybody. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. Yeah.